All right. Welcome back, everyone. So we're going into pod two, and this is the modern management of psoriatic arthritis. We have three really great talks in psoriatic arthritis, and we're starting it off with my friend and colleague, Dr. Laura Coates, who is a presentation that she recorded on an important topic, and that is remission in psoriatic arthritis. So we'll turn it over to see Laura's presentation. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to do this talk on remission in psoriatic arthritis for the Room Now conference. My name is Laura Coates. I'm an associate professor at the University of Oxford and a clinical researcher with an interest in psoriatic arthritis. So we know that psoriatic arthritis is a heterogeneous condition. Patients have different domains that are involved. And so between one patient and another, they look very, very different. So the way we treat them and the way that we assess them is crucial to make sure that we're picking up active disease and making sure that when we define remission, we're thinking about all of these six different domains, the skin and nail disease, and then the musculoskeletal disease in arthritis, enthesitis, dactylitis and axial disease. And it's complicated because most patients have an overlap of multiple domains. There are a few patients who may just have skin psoriasis or may just have arthritis. But as you can see here, the majority of patients have two domains shown in the red, three in the green or four in the orange. So most patients are presenting with multiple domains that are active and that require treatment. So if we're going to assess remission, we need to assess all of those domains to make sure that the disease is under control. So what is remission in psoriatic arthritis? So I thought I'd start by asking you. Um, so how would you define remission in psoriatic arthritis? Is it a low impact of disease so that patients can participate normally in their work and their life and hobbies? Is it linked to swollen joint count? Is it having no active swollen joints? Is it controlling both tender and swollen joints? Is it a complete absence of disease activity with ongoing DMARD therapy? So allowing ongoing treatment, but assuming that all disease is controlled? Or do you think remission is complete absence of disease activity without any ongoing treatment? So a drug free remission? Or is it just an absence of joint disease with minimal skin disease? So I think you can argue for a number of those definitions in terms of remission, but this is the one that I first looked at when we were developing outcome measures in psoriatic arthritis and have used as a benchmark moving forward. So it says that clinical remission in PSA can be conceptualized as a complete absence of disease activity with no signs or symptoms of active disease. And it requires that to be true across all facets of disease or domains of disease. But I, I do think in my clinical practice that this definition would allow for continued treatment. We can talk about a drug free remission, those who hit remission without medication. But I would also include patients who are in remission on ongoing treatment if required. And that comes from a paper by uh, Artie Kavanagh. Uh, well known to the Room Now community, uh, and Yup Franson, um, now from 2006, so a while ago. And I guess our first question is, what do the patients and the clinicians feel is remission? And I think we know and have known across multiple diseases for some time that the opinions of patients and clinicians often differ. So this slide looks at prevalence of patient-physician discordance, so where you see a patient global and a physician global that are markedly different, you can see that's present in 50 to 60 percent of psoriatic arthritis patients and a similar proportion in Axbar and in rheumatoid. So it suggests that we are thinking about different things when we measure disease activity. And if we look in that a bit, in a bit more detail in psoriatic arthritis, you can see why. So on the left hand side, if you look at joint disease, you can see that the majority of what the physician considers to be 
active disease is indicated by tender joint counts, swollen joint counts, and a little bit by pain score. That last green block at the top are the things that we can't measure, that we couldn't identify in the principal component analysis. However, in contrast, if you look at the patients, you'll see there's still a block that we can't really identify. But the biggest thing that drives their opinion of a global disease activity is pain and fatigue. So it's more about symptoms and impact than joint counts. And that's similar, really, when we think about the skin disease as well and the psoriasis. So here you can see there's a bit more um, unexplained factors shown here in the green. But when we think about psoriasis or skin disease activity, you can see here that physicians are heavily influenced by the PASI score, how red and how widespread the psoriasis is, whereas the patients are influenced, again, much more on how it impacts on them, their quality of life and the pain. So when we look at defining remission, there's a very different concept that clinicians and patients are bringing to the table. And this is data from the Reflap study. This was a study across multiple countries around the world, looking at the definition of remission and low disease activity. And we performed a principal component analysis to look at how patients define remission. So this was just to identify those patients who felt that their disease was as good as gone. And when we looked at the different components that explained that, you can see that lots of things come into it. Joint counts, psoriasis scores, age, CRP, lots of different things come together. But by far and away, the biggest influencer there is disease impact. It's pain, the PSAID questionnaire, the impact of disease questionnaire and the HAC, which is a measure of functional ability. So it's much more to them remission about what they can do, not necessarily about inflammation in the joints, as I think it's understood more by clinicians. So what are the benefits of remission? Is there any point in aiming for remission? So I thought I'd first introduce you to one of my patients. This is Joanne. Um, she lives and works in Oxford. Um, she uh, has a job as a cake decorator in one of the fanciest cake shops in Oxford. It's definitely where you would want your cake to be from. Uh, and she has psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis. And as you can see here, she has quite active disease. She's got polyarticular disease, a lot of it in her small joints. And that has a big impact on what she can do. Um, when she's doing fine, fiddly things with cakes, that's a big issue for her. She's also got relatively active psoriasis, although not active to the levels that a lot of dermatologists would see. So at the worst end, I think, for some of our rheumatology patients. Now, if we can get a 20% improvement in her joints, if she can achieve an ACR 20 in a trial, the most common trial in most of our drug trials, um, then you can see that there's a significant reduction here in her outcomes, but she's still struggling. This is not necessarily where you would want to be uh, if you were in her shoes. If we think about a 50% improvement, that's obviously a lot better. You can see things are moving in the right direction but there's still a fair amount of disease activity. And so just having that improvement actually is not enough if you want to get back to normal life. If you can achieve minimal disease activity or very low disease activity, that's when you can see that lots of things are under control here. So her joint counts have come down to pretty close to normal levels. We've got good control of her psoriasis and her patient reported outcomes. So you can see the impact and the activity are relatively low if we hit these high bars that patients want us to achieve in studies. And it's clear that if patients do achieve minimal disease activity, if their um, arthritis, enthesitis and skin disease are well controlled using the MDA criteria, that translates to better quality of life. So this figure shows the PSAID questionnaire, the impact of disease questionnaire, um, which is really, really useful in clinical practice. And this is data from a, a clinical study in the UK. And you can see here that those who are in minimal disease activity in the blue have low scores in all of these different domains in the 12 different questions within the PSAID. 
Whereas for those who are not achieving MDA, there's much higher scores across the board with those 12 different questions. And what about joint swelling? So it's not just about disease impact. If we can get people into remission criteria or minimal or low disease activity criteria, you can see the impact. So this is data from meta-analysis. Uh, and what you see here is that patients who are in remission are shown in green, uh, low disease activity in blue, and then the non-remission, non-low disease activity, so moderate or high, uh, shown in the orange or the red. And you can see here, there's a clear separation with low joint counts across the board of these many different studies, seen if people are achieving the remission criteria. And again, that translates into patient impact. So if you look here at a patient pain score, you can see that those who are in remission in green have very low scores. Those who are in low or minimal disease activity in blue have pretty low scores. But those who are in high or moderate disease activity uh, are significantly higher in the red and the orange. So there's clearly a strong correlation, which we would expect between disease activity and disease impact. But that doesn't really tell us whether an intervention can make a difference. What it tells us if, is that those whose disease is under control have better outcomes. But can we actually influence that? Can we intervene with patients who have active, more severe disease? And can we get them into a state of good control? And that's what we looked at in the TACOPA trial. So the TACOPA trial looked at treat to target in patients who are newly diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis, and those in the tight control arm were seen every four weeks, aiming for minimal disease activity. And that study showed a quite clear benefit for arthritis outcomes like ACR20, for psoriasis outcomes like the PASI, and for impact or function outcomes like the HAC, that tight control could show superiority over standard care. So having a treat to target approach where you aim for remission or low disease activity can really make a difference to patients with psoriatic arthritis. And that's not just linked to the drug that you use. So this is looking at the data from the TACOPA trial in terms of the drugs that these patients ended up on. And you can see here in the tight control group that more patients did end up on biologics, shown here in the yellow over the first year of their disease. But you can see actually a good proportion of patients in the TACOPA trial achieved MDA either on methotrexate alone or on combination DMARDs. Um, and so there is a benefit not just to the type of drug that you use, but the approach that you use in clinical practice. So is remission attainable? I'm going to start by asking you. So if you think about remission, in your patients, having that very good level of disease control and absence of disease, albeit on some treatment if required, how many of your patients do you think achieve remission in your routine clinical practice? Would it be less than 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 50, 50 to 60, or over 60% of your patients achieving remission? And what about if we change that to low disease activity? So I'm sure all of you are aware that remission isn't always feasible, particularly in patients who have very severe or long standing disease. But sometimes we look for low disease activity as well. So if we change the question slightly and we're thinking now about how many achieve low disease activity and remission. So anybody who's in a reasonably good state. How many of your patients do you think that would be? And the categories are the same as before. So less than 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 50, 50 to 60, or 60% 60 or more. So one of the things we looked at in that meta-analysis that I've shown you graphs from already was at least 27 different studies that looked at remission and residual disease activity um, in psoriatic arthritis. And these studies are all from real world data sets. 
These aren't clinical trial data sets, but you can see that included over 5,000 patients with psoriatic arthritis. And there's a big variation across the studies. It depends what measure you use of remission or low disease activity. It depends what your patients look like. It depends whether they have early disease or late disease, whether you run a, a secondary care service or a tertiary care service. But overall, across all of those studies, we saw that the percentage of people achieving a target was between 12 and 43%. So it's variable, but it's still below a half um, in routine cross-sectional studies. So it's clear that there's still more for us to do to get disease fully controlled. So what are the alternatives to remission? I've mentioned low disease activity before, um, and this goes back to that first paper back in 2006 with RT and Yarp Franson, um, suggesting that near remission might be an appropriate goal for individual patients as well. That whilst we would, can always strive for remission, it may be reasonable to accept low or minimal disease activity. And that's a similar approach to OMRAPT when they developed the MDA criteria. And that's carried through in the treat to target recommendations for spondyloarthritis. So you can see here that the main target shown in green should be for remission. But there's an alternative target of low disease activity that can be used for patients if that's more appropriate. And that's the one thing that, primary care, that um, physicians and patients do agree on. So we mentioned that often we see this disease from different perspectives and give different answers. But when we surveyed healthcare professionals and patients, you can see that the majority of both groups thought that remission or low disease activity should be the treatment target. And there should be some opportunity to personalise that for the patient in front of you in clinic. And when we look at low disease activity versus remission, I've just shown a, a kind of a blow up of this particular chart to see it a little bit clearly. And you can see here the difference in pain scores for those who were in remission in the green and low disease activity in the blue. So there is a difference. There is an added benefit if you can hit remission for your patients. But there's also an acceptance that that's not always feasible with the drugs that we have available. And that sometimes the patients don't want to try additional medication with potential side effects uh, if they're happy with the level of disease control that they have already. And when we think about measuring things, we need to think about what we're measuring in terms of remission and disease activity because that shows up some differences as well. And the two targets that are mentioned in the guidelines are the DAPSA and the minimal disease activity. And you can see here there's a big overlap. So both measures include the tender joint count, swollen joint count, patient pain and patient global. But the DAS includes a CRP and doesn't include other domains like enthesitis and skin, whereas MDA includes enthesitis and skin but not the CRP. And when we look at this in real life, what this essentially means is that minimal disease activity is a little bit harder to achieve. So this is data from the early DEPAR registry in the Netherlands, and they looked at patients over the first year being treated for psoriatic arthritis. And you can see two thirds of their patients achieved a target over the course of that year. A third of them didn't do well, that's shown in the orange. Uh, we've got around 40% who achieved both measures. They were in DAPSA low disease activity and MDA. But we've got around 20% who hit the DAPSA target, but not MDA at the same time. And when we look, again, we can see a bit of a difference. There's an improvement in both groups, um, but you can see that improvement is greater in the purple group, those who are achieving both outcomes rather than those who've only achieved a DAPSA outcome. So if you're assessing a few more domains and thinking about enthesitis and skin as well, then that should translate to slightly better outcomes for the patient in front of you. And I just wanted to finish by mentioning the power of measuring patient reported outcomes. This is something that um, has really influenced my practice. So this is a study from the US 
looking at survival for patients with a mixed diagnosis of metastatic cancer. And the patients were given PRO monitoring, remote monitoring with an app uh, where they reported their symptoms versus usual care. And all of these patients are dying. They have metastatic cancer that's incurable. But you can see here there was a benefit just for having that monitoring of PROs, for having patients monitor how they're doing, for reporting that through to clinicians and allowing us to take access in a timely fashion. So I'm going to finish by summarising with uh, these facts. So remission means different things to doctors and to people living with PSA. And that's something we have to bear in mind and we have to use in terms of our communication in clinic if we're talking about terms that may mean different things to the patients in front of us. It's clear that having controlled disease activity is associated with better quality of life. And it's clear from the treat to target studies that applying a treat to target outcome is also associated with an improvement. I think it should be fair to say that low disease activity is a very reasonable alternative target. Unfortunately, with the drugs that we have available, the delays in diagnosis, the practicalities and comorbidities, often remission isn't feasible for everyone. But low disease activity is also associated with good outcomes for the patients. And that may be a very reasonable target to aim for in practice. And the more comprehensive measures that you use, the better overall disease control that you get, and therefore the lower impact we see on patients' lives. Thank you very much.